questions. And our guest speaker is Dr. Bernadette Dunham, and she's going to tell us about her uh, career in veterinary medicine and uh, public health. One Health is her emphasis. And I'd like to start out today by thanking Dr. Dunham Bernadette, thank you for coming out today and spending this time. So tell me, what brought you to veterinary medicine? Well, first of all, Donna, thank you so much for having me today. It's a real honor to participate. I have listened to all the presentations you've had so far, and these speakers have been phenomenal, and their backgrounds are so diverse. It's a rich array of showing how diverse our veterinary profession is. So I want to thank you for doing all of that. Yeah. Um, Okay, so guess what? I was actually born in Clonefly, Wales, but my parents came over to Canada when I was about two years old. So sadly, I don't have a nice Welsh accent, which I wish I had, um, but I grew up outside of Toronto, Ontario, and I think like you've heard from most, I've always had a love of animals. Uh, that was my number one go-to, and that stayed with me enough that I did pursue um, obtaining my Doctor of Veterinary Medicine. And I did that at the Ontario Veterinary College in OVC um, in Guelph, Ontario. And I graduated in 1975. And I think going through veterinary medicine, you have a chance with all the courses to realize there's a lot of diversity. But when you get out, usually your focus is 100% on practice. Um, and mine was. And I really thought my entire career, I would do nothing but private practice. Mm. Well, that changed. I had an opportunity to taste practice. It was about four years. It was phenomenal. It taught me so much. Um, it's a rich experience, specifically because you really interact with the public. You are actually protecting their health, no matter what you do. And the whole idea I've learned is how do you communicate that we have that major role of protecting their health as well as the health of the animals under our care. It's a wonderful, wonderful mixture to be able to do that. It's, it's really rich. And um, understanding people, um, understanding personalities was something that I gleaned so much when I was in private practice. Um, I have one quick story I wanna share with you. When I graduated, uh, my partner decided to go on vacation. So I was a greenhorn and I was out there and in walked one case, this elderly gentleman with a very old German shepherd and she had a closed pie mitra. She was very sick. And I just knew right from the get-go, I could not handle this by myself. Mm -hmm. And I was quick to reach out to my fellow veterinarians in other practices nearby. And they came to the rescue. Um, this puppy dog actually needed a blood transfusion. She needed the skill of experienced surgeons. And I really was thankful they were there. But I'll never forget the look on that gentleman's face when he came back in to pick up his puppy dog and took her home. And she was his soulmate, his companion. And that's a human animal bond that again, we experience and is so rich, but I'll never forget that. And I've shared that with so many veterinarians, um, students, as well as practitioners, because when you graduate, you still need to have that access to mentoring and to realize your own limitations. I think that's the most important thing you can do in private practice is to acknowledge that and to always come back with, I'll get back to you with information, but to be upfront. And I think that's guided me through my whole profession. So that's just one quick story, but it was phenomenal. Um, had a fabulous time. And so then the infamous question all my students ask is, why did you leave private practice? Mm -hmm. So this yeah. story now engages a very significant other um, in my life. And at that time, my significant other was finishing up his PhD in biochemistry. And uh, Ray had said to me after he graduated, you know, you've done a taste of research, which I had at university. Um, why don't we just go down to the States one year postdoc? What do you think? And you can come back and you'll be back in practice. I'll probably be in one of the universities. And I thought, you know, step out of your comfort zone. Um, one year, sure, why not? This would be a lot of fun. So the scenario then was, where were we going? Well, Ray had actually thought he was gonna go um, at one point to North Carolina, but in fact, he received this infamous letter that said you could do a postdoc at MIT in Boston. <gasps> That's something you don't say no to. So okay. we were Boston bound. Mm -hmm. And at that time we didn't have Tufts University. Um, so I was trying to think, what am I gonna do? And where am I gonna go? And what was my interest? Well, I spoke to a number of faculty members and that was the key question. What was your major interest? And I thought about it and I said, you know, there's one thing that I saw every single day in practice, which fascinated me. And that was inflammation. 
you saw it from a bee sting, you saw it from surgery, you saw it from so many entities. Mm -hmm. So I really want to understand that. Now, we take for granted today all of our wonderful COX-2 and COX-1 inhibitors that we use, all our anti-inflammatories. But back then, we had so few, especially in veterinary medicine. And we were still understanding the arachidonic acid cascade and how all this worked to cause the inflammatory mediators that we've learned so much about today. So with that, the recommendation was you really should contact Dr. David Sheffro at Boston University and Dr. Herbert Heckman, MD surgeon at Peter Brigham Hospital at Harvard. I thought, wow, the two of them? Well, the reason was the two of them had joint grants, had been collaborators for years and years and years. They were an incredible team. So I knocked on their door and Dr. Sheffro said, yes, I could do what I thought was just gonna be a year of research in his lab, mm -hmm. but I was bitten by the bug and I flipped it into a full PhD program. Um, I love the research. I love being in Boston. The, the stimulation that was incredible to be close to so many fabulous academicians. And the door was always open to assist you and mentor you and challenge you. And, and it was great. So um, I had two fabulous mentors and that's exactly what I did. I stayed and finished my PhD. So I finished that in 1984. And now I thought, oh, this is really interesting. I have a DVM. I have a PhD. What am I going to do now? Ray had also finished his postdoc and was waiting for me to finish up. And he said, well, I really should look for a real job, not just be post -talking. And so with that, um, he ended up looking at the Health Science Center in Syracuse, New York. Mm -hmm. And I said, you are kidding me, Ray. We're leaving Boston for the snow belt of New York because I really didn't want to see a lot more snow. Sure. Um, but at that point in time, and this is the other thing I tell students all the time, now we have two careers and you have to jostle that. And you have to always be open, but you've got to be supportive so that each one can continue to grow in their career. And Ray's most incredible supportive person I could ever, ever want to have as my soulmate and my companion. So with that, uh, we were heading to Syracuse, New York. And I thought, okay, now what am I going to do? Well, guess what? Cornell University has their veterinary college in Ithaca, New York. It's only a mile and a half, or only, um, I should say, um, about 45 minute drive from okay. Syracuse, New York. So I thought, okay, well, now what do you really want to do? Well, I had always liked pathology and the study of disease. So I thought maybe I should just go and join the Department of Pathology. And so I contacted them and they said, well, this is really great, but we don't necessarily have an opening for a faculty member in the Department of Pathology at this time. And you don't even know if you really want to be a pathologist. So why don't you become a resident and find out if you want to be a card carrying pathologist? And so I thought, great idea. Okay, here I go. So I had gone from getting my PhD and being a research assistant professor, it was about a year. And then I, we moved to the Health Science Center in Syracuse. Um, so we did. And I worked with the infamous John King, the father of pathology at that time at Cornell. He's fabulous. And I loved it, but it wasn't my niche. After doing a full year, you know, I realized but this is not what I see myself doing for the rest of my life. But I also wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I knew it wasn't gonna be that. And so I um, thank them very, very much. It was eye opener. And I think it was a very important lesson. You need to go through those doors of opportunity and find out if the fit is correct. And if it isn't, change. We are so fortunate to have so many wonderful opportunities in our career for what we can do. So with that, with connections, um, I was put in contact with Dr. Um, Jose, or we call him Pepe, Felipe, who was the chairperson of the Department of Pharmacology at the Health Science Center at Syracuse, New York, where Ray was now in the Department of Biochemistry. And I contacted him and fascinating enough, the research that he was doing was on arrhythmias, but he wanted to understand a lot of the inflammatory changes that occur when you have arrhythmias so that there might be an opportunity to intervene sooner with medications to prevent adverse impact to people such as a major cardiac event. Well, what this did was actually taking my research that I had done on inflammation mm -hmm. to the next level of doing some site-specific mutagenesis and getting into some really good molecular biology. And I thought, what a wonderful opportunity. So now my enthusiasm just ginned right off and it's like, this would be fantastic. Sure. And again, we had multiple grants with different universities that he had coordinated in the consortium. So the exposure on the academic side was so exciting. So I did that. And then I hadn't been there probably seven months and I got a knock on the door 
from upstairs saying, you know, the Animal Welfare Act has changed in 1985. And now veterinarians are required to be in attendance at all lab animal facilities within universities. Would you consider applying for the position? Because we need a director for the division of lab animal medicine at the Health Science Center. <laughs> I thought, wow. So um, it, they did a big search. I applied for it and I got the position. And I had the most incredible opportunity of wearing those two hats because I was now doing research, teaching um, medical students in pharmacology, um, and then being able to be the director for the division of lab animal medicine. And there I had the most incredible team of dedicated people taking care of those animals. And that was why I applied for the position. They reiterated my compassion. They tried so hard and I valued that because our research animals never asked to be involved in research. And when we do research studies, we want to get the best data to help advance the care and health of the animals, as well as moving this into the care of people and how do you advance what you've learned. It was a wonderful, wonderful extension again of our public health, um, almost showing one health, one medicine, which was great. And um, I valued that. And again, short story, I took it upon myself to help them in a very special way. I thought if I could work with all of them and get them to go through the certification programs, which are different levels for lab animal technicians and lab animal technologists, wow, that would give them so much self-esteem. It would give them the recognition that I thought they weren't getting but needed to get from the researchers. And so I did, and um, they, excelled. I've got every single person certified at different levels. They were so proud and so happy and I was just proud of them. But you're always looking out to help others and advance and the care then was mutual. It, it went both ways for myself, for the researchers. And their training enabled our researchers then to truthfully get the best data from any of their protocols by working so closely with our veterinary technicians and assistants. So it was again a wonderful opportunity. And it showcased again, bringing veterinary medicine to the front table with that mutual collaboration and respect. And the MDs and the PhDs that I was working with there, we had a fabulous opportunity to do just that. And oftentimes I would say, hey, listen, there's a potential here for a new um, protocol. I'll run a, pro a pilot for you. You see what you think. And if you'd like to incorporate that, we'll do so. And their willingness to change was fantastic because sometimes they're very, very focused um, and it is difficult, but we wanted the best science at all times, and they, they met my challenge, and I couldn't have been happier. And so you say, well, that's a fabulous situation. How could you possibly leave all of that? Yeah, right. um, once again, I'm going to say it was an opportunity that Ray, as his career was evolving, was then invited to participate as a professor at George Washington University here in Washington, D.C., and I thought, Ray, this is a terrific recognition of you. Um, you really can't say no. So we jostled on that one big time. And he ended up accepting the position, but I wasn't ready to leave because I really didn't know what I was gonna do if I went to Washington, DC. And so we dated for a year. He basically was driving back and forth. I had the house and the puppy dogs and he would come and visit. And then every now and then I'd go down, but most of the time he did the driving always back and forth um, to be home with me. And about a year later, he says, you know, I love you dearly, but this is getting a little hard, <laughs> this dating. Um, maybe we should reconsider and look for something different. Well, welcome to my wonderful world of open doors when you least expect them. Um, oh, you yes, had this, this person on and this, I yeah. got a call from the infamous Dr. Pam Abney, who at that time was with the American Veterinary Medical Association in their government relations division office in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And she said, why would you be interested in this job? Because someone had said, you should just put your name in and apply for it. It's one thing you could do, it's with the AVA. And I did, and she called me back and she said, but I'm just curious because you, with your CV, what's bringing you here? And sure enough, I told her the situation as I just did now with Ray. And she said, would you come down and interview? And with her and Dr. Robert Jorgensen, who was the director at the time I interviewed and I got the position. So I got to join the AVMA in the GRD, um, Government Relations Division. But I got to tell you, when I first accepted this, I was very apprehensive in my own right, because I said to myself, but this is government. This is working with members on the Hill and their staff. 
what do I know about politics? I'm a researcher, I'm a veterinarian, and I've been doing all this, but Pam turned it around. And I suddenly realized, but what we were doing was bringing veterinary medicine to the forefront of the members of Congress. And why would you want a veterinarian involved in whatever topic we were talking about? What does a veterinarian do? It gave me an opportunity through education, which I love, and teaching, which I love, um, to put that teaching hat on. So rather than being a lobbyist, I said, I'm an educator. And I met with members on the Hill and their staff. And we brought many, many issues of veterinary medicine to the forefront and explained to them, because you have their ear right away when you say you're a veterinarian. First of all, they're gonna tell you all their stories, ask you all these questions. And then you can say, well, what I'm really here to do is to talk about said issue. Really, veterinary medicine's involved in that? How? And you get a chance to showcase and take us out of the white coats that just in their mind, take care of companion animals, food animals, and do so much more. And that's where the public health side that they hadn't thought about comes to the forefront. It was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful situation. And I do thank Pam every day for that because I was there for eight years. Who would have thought? Um, fabulous opportunity. We got some major legislation through that advanced veterinarians and, and the care for our animals, um, going from Amduca to our Minor Years Manor Species Act. We did so much. And to see all that flourish, um, we were able at that time to showcase why veterinarians and surveillance of disease, zoonoses in animals that can potentially spill over and impact people was so important. We've got to have that network of communication. It was phenomenal. And so once again, you're going to say, but you didn't stay there after eight years. What happened? And while you're there, and I tell students this a lot, you know, people are watching you, whether you realize it or not. Mm -hmm. how you engage, committees you're on, what you're doing, publications, all of that comes to play. Well, in Washington, D.C., it is not unusual specifically to see people move around a lot because of the networking, what they bring to the table. Um, and even though we tease, so inside the belt, well, you move around a lot and you get a lot of credit for doing that. People look at you on the outside and they say, what, can't you hold a job longer than eight, eight years? Um, but this yeah, one here yeah. was a great opportunity because... Dr. Stephen Sunloff was the director for the Center for Veterinary Medicine at the US Food and Drug Administration. And courtesy of the ADMA, we helped a lot of the agencies, especially when it comes to appropriations, because they cannot lobby or push to Congress. You can be invited to come to Congress if they want some technical advice, but you can't lobby Congress and say, I really need A, B, and C. But coalition groups can. And so the art of building coalition groups and bringing people together from disparate groups where you can all agree today on this issue was phenomenal because you can then respectfully disagree on another day on a different topic, but you don't take it personal. You can go out and have a drink together afterwards, but you're all doing what you need to do to move these important issues forward. And so coalition building was quintessential to helping the agencies. And apparently Dr. Sunloff really liked a lot of what he saw. And he asked if I'd ever thought of stepping into government. And of course the answer was no, but then I thought I was just gonna be a practicing veterinarian my whole life and look where I am. And he blew me out of the water because he said, well, you know, we'd love for you to apply for this one position that we have open. That was to become the director for the Office of New Animal Drug Evaluation. We affectionately call that ONAID. And I said, Steve, I love you dearly. I can do a lot for you and your agency in my position with the ABMA but I don't know the Food and Drug Cosmetic Act in all the details, that's not my forte. And he said, but that's not why we would wanna hire you. And I said, what do you mean? He said, we're looking at a leadership role. We're looking for what you bring for people that will work with you. You have all the expertise you could possibly want with the staff that is there, with the people that we have and the training they have. And I, it made me step back and I thought, wow, that's incredible. But, um, like usual, it was the door of opportunity. So I thought, okay, I'll go through the door. So I went and I did the interview. And the interview took place in a hotel. And I would say the room was filled with probably over 100 people. Most of them were people that worked in Oni. Because Dr. Sunloff had asked them to listen to all the people being interviewed for this position and to let him know who they wanted. Oh, what a great And what a that great knocked me out of the park. I said, wow, this agency does something that I value. They care about people. They don't just say, oh, by the way, here's your new director. They let you participate. 
And it was a marvelous, marvelous interview. I, I'll never forget that. It was the best I've ever had. So I come back and sure enough, I get a phone call. And he says, well, I, I really, I'm thrilled you, you've interviewed, but guess what? Um, you didn't get the position. I said, Steve, I am not the one for that position. Truthfully, Steve Vaughn, who was at Onaid and had a, apply for the position was the one who should be the director of Onaid. You are getting ready to do a DUFA. This is a user fee program, et cetera. He has grown up. He knows everything so well. And I, I congratulate you on that. And I got to tell you, I had so much fun with the interview and I'm so proud of what you've been doing at CDM. Great. Thanks. Have a good day. Mm -hmm. And I thought that would be it. And I didn't mind at all. I mean, I was just going to continue doing what I love. But I got a phone call back from Dr. Vaughn after I had congratulated him. And he said, I had no idea you'd be applying. Would you, would you consider stepping in and being the deputy? Because think what the two of us could do if we were both here knowing it. I said, you've got to be kidding me. Oh. This was a dream come true because I was so impressed and so thrilled. And I said, Steve, I will accept. And so I stepped into government that way. And I served as a deputy for own aid and worked with this incredible staff of which you've met one, Dr. Renata Ranshushul. She was just phenomenal. But they're all like that. They're dedicated, they're so smart, and they're so wanting to do as veterinarians, improve how we take care of the health of these animals. And very specifically when it comes to food animals, assuring the food safety and the major issues and zoonosis that we're looking at for public health. It was just phenomenal. And while I was there, once again, it, it pinched me. Um, you get to continue to showcase, they, go, they give you opportunities. I think I was blown out of the water when Dr. Sunwalk was then asked to step over shortly thereafter uh, in 2008, mm -hmm. uh, and I'd stepped into government in 2002, um, to become the director for the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. And he'd been our longest standing director at the Center for Veterinary Medicine. And he said, so more than likely, um, you're gonna be stepping in to be the director. And at that time, Dr. Andrew von Eschenbach was the commissioner of FDA. And I said, oh, I don't think so, Steve. That's not how we do things here at CBM. And he looked at me and he says, but this is the commissioner who's going to call you into his office. And I said, that's okay. Dr. Von Eschenbach called me in the office to do exactly what Dr. Sunlaw said. And I said, well, with all due respect, but that's not how we do it. I will only accept this position, which would be the highest honor of all, if you reach out to the folks at CVM and ask them what they want, just like Steve had done when I applied. And he said, I can do that. And so he came and he spoke to the staff at CVM and said, you can call me, you can send me an email. Um, how about a week? Let me know if you wanna do a search. Let me know if you wanna have Bernadette. Um, I, I can't tell you how I feel because I was so humbled by the love that came out from the group because they appointed me the position. And that's how I became the director for the Center for Veterinary Medicine. And again, I had eight years of doing that, which was phenomenal. Um, couldn't be prouder of all that we accomplished together. And that opportunity was just amazing. And um, yes, so you can tell I graduated a long time ago. So my career is winding down. Ray's career was, I'm set to do some retirement. How do we coordinate this? And so as you can probably tell, I can't sit still very long. So I thought, well, I do wanna slow it down, but I'm not gonna be able to just do nothing. And so at that point of time, Believe it or not, um, Dr. Lynn Goldman is the director of the Milken Institute School of Public Health at George Washington University. And, oh, I have to stop for two seconds, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, so Ray's career, when you, I told you he was at GW, that changed a little while later. And when I told you that I had stepped into government, he was then contacted by the National Cancer Institute. And he stepped into government at the National Cancer Institute of NIH. Um, to be one of their head um, leaders for their clinical trials. And very specifically, his whole focus was on the development of biomarkers in cancer. And he then spent and finished his career with the National Cancer Institute. So again, both of us then being in government, it was just an incredible recognition of him. I just wanted to let you know that. So for me now, back to uh, GW, who was who would have thought, Ray's leaving after all of those years, and now I'm coming into GW. Um, I wanted to find out if maybe I could wind down by just giving a few lectures um, to students. And my focus, yes, was One Health because I knew how important it was to help other entities and specifically schools of public health to really appreciate One Health, which is what it's all about. How we do understand that human health, animal health, 
plant health, environmental health touches us all. And how do we then do the working together, the collaboration together to make a difference? And so when I spoke with her, she said, you know, this would be fantastic. And I said, well, I would love it because I want to try to wind down, but I don't want to just like stop immediately. And so um, the end of 2016, 17, um, that's exactly what I did. And I was thrilled because the very first year there, I was able to reach out to the students talking about One Health. And we formed, the students formed the first group to apply for the One Health Commission student application for a One Health Day project. So November 3rd is when we celebrate internationally One Health Day. And they were one of the three groups that won that particular first year competition. I was so proud of them and it was just fantastic. And one of those has gone on to become a veterinarian. The other two have continued to become um, MPH's uh, Master of Public Health and one went on to become an MD. So it was just the perfect example of One Health, not only with this group of students, but took it further. And so, yes, right now that is all I'm doing is just giving a couple now guest lectures. I did some full-time semester teaching to really help along, but now I just do guest lectures and I'm having so much fun as my retirement gets closer and closer. And I, I just, I pinch myself every day to think who would have thought this little girl born in Wales, grew up in Canada, touch base in the United States and look where my career has gone when all I thought I would ever be was a practicing veterinarian. The richness of our training, our career, it is the most incredible profession. And I am so thrilled to see you bring people that can further to highlight the diversity of what we can do. And if those doors of opportunity open, please walk through them because it will enrich your entire life in ways that you have no idea. So there you go, that's my story. <laughs> I uh, I want to thank you so much for for going through all the highlights. I, I want to I want to ask you when you when you say the door is open, uh, do you find amongst um, all the other episodes you listen to that that is a recurring theme? A door opens and all of a sudden there's an opportunity. I think you saw that with a number of the people you were talking to, um, not only with Dr. Abney, but you had Dr. Bonnie Button on, and I think she highlighted in her career the diversity she had for exposure. Dr. Angela Demery, I think, really showcased when we first met her, and she was a student intern um, at the ADNA GRD, and how she went on yes. to become a AAAS fellow. She was a congressional fellow. She's been in the Army, the military. Um, she's been an incredible speaker. She's run for Congress. I mean, Yes, uh, you have, and of course, Renata with her research and how she moved in, left academia that came into government. Mm -hmm. I think each one of them have highlighted beautifully that um, you have these opportunities. The question is, do you want them? Um, because they are there. Um, many times you hear about veterinarians that are getting burned out. They've been in practice for quite a while. Yes. And it can be challenging. It can be heart-wrenching at times. Um, and some, they say, it's becoming too routine. Mm -hmm. And once again, those that love it and do their entire career there, we thank you because we need you. Mm -hmm. But it's okay to change. And you bring so much more because, as I said before, the, what I learned in practice I utilize so much of that in so many ways with my career as it opened up. And I think they're finding the same opportunity. Now, many of them will say, well, do I have to get another degree? It depends upon what you wanna do. Um, you're finding a lot will pursue getting a master's of public health because that is the beautiful degree that links so much of what we've been talking about together. And I think it's a plus. You don't always have to do that though. Um, because we have this incredible training. Um, MDs are the same way. They may or may not add additional degrees on. Now, when it comes to a PhD, that's a little bit more unique because that really is very focused. And if you're going to do that, usually you end up, yes, staying in research um, and doing the grant writing and the teaching in academia, but you don't always. Um, but once again, you're using skill sets and knowledge base, but you also have check the box that when you're applying for positions, you have met the criteria and it just opens up a few more doors a little bit easier. But for veterinarians, um, many times you can just stay with your DVM and, and the door will open. I think sometimes I tell them, if you look at a position where you're looking to change, don't always look for the requirement that you be a veterinarian because you're gonna li limit yourself right away because you can bring so much. You can sometimes write your job description and make it what you want because you're bringing to the table skill sets that people hadn't realized they need that you bring because of our diversity and our training and our experience. 
And that I think empowers you. And again, um, allows you to do a lot more than what you thought. So don't limit yourself on that note. Does that answer like, your question a little bit? Perfect, yes. I also like the fact that you said you tried something out. That was that one year in pathology. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, that's not quite for me. What I add on to that is I say no knowledge is wasted. And I'm sure that the experience itself was something that stood you in good stead going forward, regardless that you didn't stay in pathology per se. Would you, would you agree? I certainly would agree with that. Again, you're building relationships. I still keep in touch with so many of my colleagues at that time. Yes, many of them did go on, became board certified, which is fantastic. But you learn so much, again, about the disease process that even though you're not certified in pathology as a board certified pathologist, you again, bring that to so many issues. And as I said, with everything I've touched upon, especially today when we're looking at zoonosis, um, why you want a veterinarian front and center, our surveillance programs, all of that comes into play as you understand the pathology of disease. And I think right now COVID opened up the eyes of the world in a way that we needed a long time ago, but it, it, it's there now. And that is we do have one globe and we travel, microbes travel. Guess what? We will see more spillover of certain diseases and they can spread. And how do you then tune in with governments opening the door to make sure they're willing to collect information through good surveillance programs where you're not staying in your silos. So your veterinarians are talking to your physicians or talking to the government. They're doing the sharing of the data that they need to share so we can be better prepared and hopefully respond. And I think the other thing about COVID, as you and I both know, this was an example also of a reverse zoonosis. So the education again of certain diseases that people have, they can give to animals and that's exactly what we saw. But for so many, it is reverse. It is, is always animals spilling over to people. And how do we better protect animals to minimize that? How do we protect people so they're not gonna have the exposure and potentially then have a disease? And in private practice, we did that all the time from vaccination against very critical diseases, rabies being number one, to understanding how our pets are often sleeping on our beds, our children are holding them and kissing them and the exposure is so close. What are the potentials there for certain bacteria, certain parasites, viruses, again, to be spilling over? So we are protecting that entire family. And the role of the veterinarian is then beautifully embraced in that one health approach that we, we talk about now more than ever. So those are the things that I'm so glad we are seeing. And I'm thrilled that both the G7, G20, our international leaders are embracing one health and understanding that we do have to work together because if we don't, we won't be prepared for what will come next. And we know there'll be another one. Um, the other thing I wanna mention is veterinarians, luckily, are really loved by the public. They always have been, which is great because then they become a trusted entity. And right now we need that because we have witnessed many people losing trust in science, losing trust in our public health leaders. We have vaccine hesitancy around the globe, not just because of COVID. How do we reach out and help people understand? And many times you find veterinarians are really good at listening, letting people ask questions, giving them time to digest information that we provide to them. We do it all the time in practice yes. and letting them come back. And when you do that, you are building that trust. And now you're providing good science and you're helping them make very important decisions. And that again, I think is so valuable. It's an important role that we as veterinarians play. And I think if we can make the difference in people so that they do understand and they do appreciate the science, it's gonna help all of us. And so. The world is facing these challenges right now. And I think it's important that we all step up. And certainly the association that you're with is so critical when it comes to what you have, food safety and public health. And you put those two together beautifully. Oh, yes. Yeah. So we did do the combination um, around 2016, I believe, where we brought what was at that time called the Association of Food Hygiene Veterinarians and coupled with public health veterinarians. And I, I feel like the collaboration has made us so much more stronger and, and we have such a depth and breadth of knowledge that I want to bring out to the world through these podcasts. So what 
do you do you happen to remember what brought you to our association as the as, as far as being a member? It was Dr. Abby who had reached out and she said, I just joined this group. It's fantastic. And, you know, and I hadn't tuned into it the way I should have. I mean, I had with many groups, but I hadn't really looked at that. And I should have. I, I just I was doing public health. I mean, why wouldn't I? So my apologies, but I very quickly revamped that and became a member. Um, and now, as I said, I have listened to all of these podcasts that you've been hosting and watching what you're doing. And I, I couldn't be prouder to be a member and to be able to, as I say to many, become an ambassador. We've become an ambassador for the association, for your group, for One Health, for veterinary medicine. Um, that's a real thrill. And so I'm very proud to be participating in the group and to be a member with you. So it's great. So kudos again. And I will say, um, I think you are through this outreach to be commended because it is so true. Um, many times we're so close, we take it for granted that people are aware, understand things, tuned in, but they're not. And so this is a really important way of making it easy for people to contact, to access the webpage and listen to this and think about, oh, wow, we have all these opportunities. Look what they're doing to protect food safety. Look at their role in public health, which I hadn't thought of before. That's tremendous. And we need to have more of that right now. Um, because this, again, is, I think, a fabulous recognition of the veterinary profession in ways that I said earlier, people have already put us in our boxes of the white coats and what we do. And we want to highlight that we do so much more. And it's again, getting people to reach across the aisle, work together. And I think that is gonna be the success. And veterinarians do that beautifully. They really, really do. Because we've always been reaching out with everything we've done in our training and our practice, et cetera. And I think we need to be able to showcase that to the world. And your group is doing that beautifully. Well, I love the, that you mentioned several times about how clinical veterinarians are already doing public health in their day-to-day -day work. And I am good friends with a number of state veterinarians who are part of our association as well. And they tell me stories about how clinical veterinarians are reaching out to them constantly. That's what their day is. They're not just there pushing papers uh, for the state. They are interacting on a uh, moment by moment basis and answering questions for the clinical medicine that's happening out there. And a lot of that, of course, did have to do with COVID. And I'd, I'd like to, to say that I believe because we have such a strong uh, background in, uh, in not in veterinary medicine itself and it, and it, it is such a broad knowledge base, we're able to, to talk about zoonoses and the fact that, yes, while COVID was occurring in some pets, as well as we know, of course, the zoo animals, that was always hitting the news. But uh, I believe that once it was understood and identified very quickly um, on the veterinary side, that we were able to reassure people that they did not have to euthanize their pets because that was a number one question. And, and people were, were very concerned and fearful, but veterinarians were able to explain what was happening and assure them that we'll give supportive care to the pets and they will recover. They're not going to make you sick. You didn't get sick from your pet in this case. And, and I, I bring that up because uh, in uh, 2020, we gave uh, our award our annual award uh, to all the veterinarians, just in general, because of uh -huh. the hard yes, because of the hard work that they did, and we will have that highlighted on our new website that we're building. We are renovating it completely and um, having so many new offerings on it, uh, and and the uh, and that award will be uh, will be available for clinical veterinarians to to download because that is their award. And I also am so proud to say that we are going for the first time ever to have a job board and jobs will be able to be posted at no cost and, uh, and all members can take a look at that job board and that will be updated. Now, let me tell you what I found as 25 years in clinical practice and my big push into food safety for myself was because I ended up joining the army very late in life in 2008. And then I became a member of this association, again, through 
Dr. Rothfield as, as primarily, and she was one of um, uh, one of the interviews that I did earlier. And she was in the army, and and I found myself deep diving into food safety, which I love food, so that was good. But <laughs> but the thing was that was so amazing is is the army also has a huge component of public health. And I had so much experience from that, that later on um, around 2012, I was deployed as a civilian contractor for a medical company that did work for the US embassy in Iraq. And I was the director of public health. Now, I did not have my masters at the time. All I had was my DVM and the vast amount of experience I had in the army for three, four years. <laughs> but, the army, but understand this, in the army, I'd had a few deployments. So that was very much intensive on the job training. <laughs> um, I loved it. I, I loved being the director of public health. Um, I never thought that it would be so um, incredible to be exposed to very many different scenarios. We had a person who came back from their leave um, with TB. <laughs> and, wow. and, and everybody looked at me, including the human doctors, and said, okay, what are we doing to clean the environment? And just like you said, you know, the answer is I'll get back to you shortly with that information. <laughs> but it was it was fantastic. Uh, I, um, I found that it was a true partnership uh, between me and the medical doctors there. And, um, and, and I can't emphasize enough uh, to everyone that even if you are in clinical practice, um, you're welcome to join us here in our association. And if perhaps anyone here is looking to make some type of job transitions or want to just see what's out there and opportunities, uh, this is the place to be as well. Uh, when, you know, when I was considering leaving private practice and I had to say, well, what am I going to do next? The army was really knocking on my door, but I'm sitting at the most common place on the AVMA job board looking and I'm saying like, well, what else is there besides clinical practice? And there's not a lot on there. I have found that that through my networking and the different um, veterinarians I know through our association, they post to our list form and they are saying, oh, here's a job here. And this is another job. And these jobs are just not showing up in, in conventional places that we think of, right? Right, exactly. It's very much word of mouth. And, and that was the thing I said earlier, don't always be looking for a job that lists you need to have a veterinary degree because you can do so many things and you've just highlighted again um, what you brought to the table beautifully. And, and that is so true. So we often cut ourselves short and I, we limit ourselves. So I think it's great that you can have an expansive um, board that will list a variety of opportunities that people just weren't thinking about because they're so ingrained to think, well, my degree's in veterinary medicine, so I guess I should look for a job where they're looking for a veterinarian. Um, but you don't have to limit yourself. You can do so much more. And I just want to say, again, kudos to you, Donna, for what you've been doing for the whole association. Um, you have reached out and you have done what I think is so important. And you have said, thank you, uh, which those two words, however you say them in any language that you say them mean so much to people. And when it comes with from the heart, with true compassion, Man, you just win people over every single time and they really, really appreciate that. We often don't slow up enough to acknowledge the wonderful folks that we're working with and what they're doing, um, the hardships they're facing and they're still giving their all. And yet when you can stop and, and acknowledge and say, thank you, it's huge. And I think you've exemplified that beautifully with what you just shared with us right now. So back to you with a big thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much for, for going through um, all of your highlights in your career and sharing such wonderful stories. I, I want to, to also say that uh, I am really in awe of all of the people, yourself especially, who've come on. And, and I, I didn't know you before this, uh, right, folks? I, I'm telling you, I had to find out how to pronounce her last name, which is easier than rhyme shoes so hi Renata but uh, Bernadette um, and I had not ever talked before and so this was um, a fantastic opportunity and dare I say I feel like I have a new friend and I Definitely. am just so excited and I kind of feel like I I um, 
geez, I just really expanded my horizon. So this has been a very fulfilling and satisfying uh, situation for me as well by doing these interviews. So uh, any any last words to share with us? Because I, I honestly, I, I realize you're not actually retiring per se. I mean, you're still going strong. So. Oh, I'm still doing some stuff. I think the other opportunity that came my way was, um, and I was very, again, honored, but I was invited to join the National Academies of Science, and this is in their board on agriculture and natural resources. So hmm. participating there, again, with the most incredible people you could possibly want and where science is leading us um, to be able to address these big issues of which climate change, as you well know, is huge. And that's one of the big ones that touches us all, touches the whole globe. And how do we work together to solve these challenging issues has been phenomenal. So that's still keeping me busy. And again, these are great opportunities that you get. You get to be on boards um, of other groups as well. Uh, and I am being a big one where we look at antimicrobial resistance. And you and I both know how important that is and the role again that veterinarians play. We all have to come together with that when it's almost like a silent pandemic on its own right. And everybody has a role because the bacteria are so challenging and so smart and they just manage to mutate and where we go now. Um, it takes a long time for human drugs, veterinary drugs to get approved. And when it comes to what are the new drugs in our armamentarium against infectious diseases, it's limited. And so it behooves us all to say, how do we all judiciously use these important drugs, develop new approaches, embrace new technologies, cutting edge science, it's a win for the protection of human health and animal health. And that's the beauty, I think, of us in the profession, uh, being a part of that, uh, being able to make changes that benefit the world. And when you can sit back and look at that, you sit back and you're actually very, very proud to be a small portion of making a difference in the lives of others. Yes, thank you, that's so true. And everyone, I want to uh, assure you that I will be posting um, <laughs> in the show notes, the um, awesome CV here from, uh, from Dr. Dunn. And I want to let you know that any of the abbreviations that she talked about will be written out. So don't worry, you'll see it there. Um, and, and one last um, question. Um, if folks want to get a hold of you, uh, how, how could they do that? Do you have a preference in terms of the email or something of that nature? You can list uh, my contact information that I've given you. They can contact me by email or by phone. Happy to reply anytime. Okay, perfect. So thank you again so much. Thank you. I really had such a fantastic time talking with you. I enjoyed you. meeting you, Donna. It was a real pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.